Okay, I think we'll go ahead and start. Welcome everyone to the um, virtual format. This is our inaugural uh, virtual format for the Cousins Center Lecture Series in Psycho Neuroimmunology, uh, sponsored by the Cousins Center and also the UCLA Semmel Institute for Neuroscience and Human Behavior. Um, it's really a pleasure for me to welcome to you today, Robin Nesluk, who comes to us from Northwestern University. We had invited him last year, but weren't able to host him in person because the onset of the pandemic, but I'm so glad that he's able to present some of his work today to us um, about how stress gets under the skin and neuroimmune network perspective. Um, Robin is an associate professor of psychology at Northwestern University. He's also director of the Effective and Clinical Neuroscience Laboratory and interim director of the Center on Social Disparities in Health. I really had a pleasure of reading through his uh, curriculum vitae this morning and looking at all the great work that he's done. He's published over 70 articles um, and more recently uh, some has gone into the area of psychoneuroimmunology and, and the role of inflammation on reward circuits. Uh, with a publication in Biological Psychiatry, and I also am aware of a publication that's pending in American Journal of Psychiatry. So he's really, uh, you know, come into our field in a big way, and I'm really delighted to uh, have him do so because his work in neuroscience of an emotion and health is really at cutting edge. And I think what's particularly notable is his efforts to also understand social disparities in health in collaboration with uh, Edith Chen and uh, Greg Miller at Northwestern University. So, uh, uh, so I do want to remind everyone that you have an opportunity to ask questions at the end of our presentation. Robin says he'll probably end in about 45, 15 minutes in that range. There's a Q&A uh, a box or icon at the bottom of your screen. Please use that. The chat is not available to you. Um, I will try to uh, read all those questions and, uh, and paraphrase them if necessary and then ask Robin those questions. All right, thank you very much. And I look forward to hearing Robin's uh, presentation today. Robin? Great, well, yeah, I'm gonna share my slides here and um, see if we can get this started. Can you see my slides, Michael? Yes, I can see your slides. Great, okay. Um, well, it is, I'm just gonna move this out of the way. Uh, it is such a, a pleasure to be here um, today, and thank you so much for uh, inviting me, and thank you, Michael, for your introduction. Um, just, you know, briefly a little bit about my, myself. I was trained as a kind of a classic circuits neuroscientist interested in how the brain creates emotion, how those brain systems are implicated in disorders of emotion from depression to anxiety um, to uh, addiction and mania. Um, and recently, um, and I still continue to do this work and it's a, a heart of, of, of what I do and it's a major focus of what I do. And actually one of my primary collaborations is at UCLA with Michelle Krask and Susan Bookheimer. Um, I've also become interested in, as of late um, in not just examining internal factors uh, of risk for, for mental and physical health problems, but also examining external factors and how those external factors embed themselves in our biology and generate subsequent risk for both mental and physical health problems. And this really has stemmed from a very dear friendship and collaboration with Edith Chen and Greg Miller, both of whom are at Northwestern. Um, and uh, I run with Greg four days a week. And over time, we've been, you know, talking a fair amount about our respective interests. And, you know, as you probably know, Edith and Greg both trained at UCLA, and you can see the UCLA icon in Greg's jack jacket there. Um, and we just realized there was a really nice synergy of our work, me training in neuroscience, Greg obviously having, and, and Edith having a rich uh, research program on stress and immunology and health. Um, and that really has facilitated for me a, a new set of questions that I'm very intrigued by, which I'll focus uh, on my talk today. And so the first question is how is it that adversity in the environment actually gets underneath our skin and embeds itself in our biology and then how does that generate risk for not just particular psychiatric or physical health problems, but how does it generate risk for a broad range of mental and physical health problems? And um, it's important to emphasize that chronic stressors uh, and multiple forms of stressors are associated with many mental and physical health problems across the lifespan. So just to give you an example of one particular stressor that we know has a robust effect 
on multiple levels of, of psychology and biology is poverty. So if you look at epidemiological data, people who are living um, at you know below the poverty level actually die at an earlier rate. So if you look here, these are percent of the federal poverty line where blue scores here indicate high levels of poverty, and yellow uh, values here reflect um, higher SES. What you can see is, is that individuals who are living at or below the poverty level actually have lower life expectancies. And this is particularly true for black individuals where there seems to be substantial health disparities in how stress affects individuals. Um, this is also present across the lifespan. So we see this at the earliest stages of life. So if you look at individuals who have a uh, high school um, degree or lower, um, their children are more likely to have neonat neonatal mortality or infant mortality relative to individuals who are college educated or, or beyond. Um, you see the effect of adversity on health and well being in adolescence and childhood. For example, children who are living at or below the federal poverty level um, have higher rates of obesity. And we know obesity is a substantial risk factor for multiple forms of both psychological and physical illnesses. And it's also a risk factor for atherosclerosis, which is one of the primary risk factors uh, that, that predicts the onset of cardiovascular disorders and various cardiometabolic problems down the road. So we see this, this um, presence of stressor in adolescence. And then it continues into adulthood where we know that you know, people who um, grew up in poverty, um, and even if they've left poverty, who grew up in poverty are more likely to die at an earlier age. So this is adults who grew up in a low socioeconomic status house versus those who grew up in a high socioeconomic status house. And you can see they're more likely to um, die at an earlier age. And so at multiple stages and multiple levels of analysis, stress, adversity, chronic adversity, et cetera, um, leaves its footprint on our biology and is associated with age or developmentally appropriate illnesses with middle to childhood problems with asthma and respiratory infection and in early adolescence, you see the onset of psychiatric illness, depression, substance use, um, early cardiometabolic risk factors, and then into later adulthood, you see more kind of standard cardiometabolic problems, et cetera. And so this again, for me, raises the question of how is it that adversity gets under the skin? In particular, how does it generate risk for such a heterogeneous set of mental and physical health problems? Now, historically, and I'm actually you know, talking to people who, who haven't taken such a single organ perspective given the, the PNI focus of, of this wonderful center, uh, the Cousin Center, but um, you know, in, in, in much of medicine and psychology, research has taken a single disease or a single organ system. Um, and obviously we all are beginning to agree on the need for a next generation uh, program of research that really takes a multi-organ perspective and understands how multiple organs intersect and communicate with each other in a way that can generate risk. And if we're gonna take such a perspective, it's important to consider, well, what are good organs and what are good Canada organ systems to take such a, an interdisciplinary perspective? And you know, as you uh, have really spearheaded the way, um, the brain and the immune system are really good targets for such a multi-organ perspective. The central nervous system is in consistent conversation and communication with peripheral inflammation. Peripheral inflammation is in consistent communication with the central nervous system. CNS cells like microglial signaling is very important for you know, a host of psychiatric conditions that we're finding. And so, you know, again, gener you know, decades of research have, has really highlighted the importance and value of neuroimmune signaling is, as a risk factor for mental and physical health problems. And so my talk today is twofold. I first want to present a neuroimmune network model uh, that my colleague Greg Miller and I have put forth a few years ago to examine how stress gets under the skin. And second, I want to then spend the next part of my talk saying, well, what are the mechanisms in the brain and actually in the environment that might facilitate resiliency to neuroimmune dysregulation and also stress-related health problems? So this uh, was really my entry point into uh, psychoneuroimmunology, this paper that I wrote with Greg Miller. This is at Biological Psychiatry, which kind of emerged from our, our multiple runs. And we put these ideas onto paper. And this was really a transitional po uh, point for me in my career. And this is the, uh, the figure from the particular paper. It's a complex figure, but I want to make it simple and, and walk you through it. So 
Um, the first you know, component of this figure that I wanna highlight is that stress matters. And there's growing evidence that early stress matters and that early adversity matters. And that those early years are really important for establishing the psychobiological set point for the mind and brain. There's also compelling evidence that a primary target for adversity in the brain is the amygdala. So we all know that the amygdala is kind of the brain's fire alarm. It's involved in threat and vigilance. Um, it's also responsive to positive stimuli. So many people consider the amygdala to be a primary salient center in the brain, which is uh, uh, very much aware of the salient and threatening stimuli in the environment. And given that particular relevance to those stimuli, the, the amygdala appears to be a primary target for stress associated structural and functional alterations. And so you can see this in rodents, you can see this in primates, you can see this in humans, um, you can see this with structural MRI, you can see this with functional MRI, that the amygdala appears to be a primary target for early adversity, which makes sense because if the brain is living in an adverse situation, it wants to be highly sensitive to the ad adversity it finds itself in. There's also growing evidence of which you're probably all very well aware that early ad adversity also can sensitize um, the immune cells that facilitate and sustain inflammation in the periphery. And this work appears to suggest that early adversity can particularly target monocytes, which are involved in initiating a pro-inflammatory phenotype and in the short term, this is highly adaptive. However, when chronic, this can result in chronic low-grade inflammation, which is associated with a host of problems. And so, uh, again, I'm talking to a group of experts, but just, uh, you know, just to define our terms, uh, what is inflammation? It's one of the first responses of the immune system to irritation and infection. It's stimulated by chemical factors, cytokines, chemokines, et cetera, to facilitate tissue repair, clear into pathogens. It's all hugely adaptive and highly important, and we'd be dead immediately without it. Um, but under situations of chronic inflammation, there's a host of health problems that can emerge. And I wanna highlight the fact that these health problems that emerge are the identical health problems that are associated with early life adversity. So it appears that early life adversity and inflammation really confluence together in terms of generating risk for various mental and physical health problems, and importantly, health problems across the developmental spectrum from early adolescence to middle to later adulthood. So I just wanna present a, one, one study, which is a proof of concept study from my colleague, Greg Miller, who I think this was a collaboration he did with Steve Cole at UCLA. Um, these are individuals who grew up in low socioeconomic status. These are individuals with high socioeconomic status. This particular study looked at IL-6, which is a pro-inflammatory cytokine, cytokines being primary mediators of inflammatory signaling. They're particularly good for human research because they can be assayed in blood. And so IL-6, as you can see here, is higher amongst those who grew up in, in low socioeconomic status relative to those who grew up in high socioeconomic status. And this work, this particular paper also highlights the fact that in, um, adversity can leave its footprint on the genome where it can influence the expression, the gene expression pathways of, of inflammatory genes that are involved in, in immune signaling. Now, what's important here is that the mechanisms in large, in, in part, largely driven by the wonderful work happening at UCLA, that the mechanisms here by which the stress in the world affects the immune system may be in part through the brain. And as mentioned, stress can modulate amygdala signaling. We know that the amygdala is a primary driver of sympathetic outflow and facilitating stress biology in the periphery. So in the amygdala is activated, it signals uh, cells in the brainstem and the hypothalamus to activate the sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system synapses onto developing monocytes, maybe alters the trajectory of hematopoietic stem cells to create a pro-inflammatory phenotype in the bone marrow, which is then released into the periphery um, and initiates a pro-inflammatory phenotype. And so again, we have a mechanism by which the brain and particularly the brain stress systems directly modulate peripheral inflammation. Um, this is also affected by hormonal outflow via the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, um, and in particular, glucocorticoids and cortisol, which initially may enhance inflammatory signaling, but subsequently become very important for initiating inhibitory processes and regulating um, the, the reduction of inflammation and stress 
again, can modulate this peripheral inflammatory signaling via these established pathways. Now, what's intriguing is, is that, you know, more recently, and again, facilitated a lot by the work at the Cousin Center, we know that this is a two-way street, where not only does the brain affect the immune system, but the immune system appears to have a robust effect on the brain. And what I'm finding interesting and intriguing is, is that it doesn't appear to be random by which the brain accesses the, uh, where, by which peripheral information accesses the brain. It can enter the brain through multiple mechanisms. It can be active transport through endothelial cells in the brain. It can be leaky portions of the blood brain barrier, vent circumventricular organs activating the vagus nerve. Um, but what's becoming clear is, is that the immune to brain signaling is targeting or are targeting brain regions that we care about as people who are interested in emotion and, and psychological well-being. One of those regions is the amygdala. So we know, for example, that inflammation can accentuate uh, amygdala signaling. Um, and this makes sense because if the body's in a state of defense, it wants the brain to be in a state of defense. So it makes sense to coordinate these respective systems. Um, I'm just gonna present one study um, that uh, uh, was from your group um, because it's one of my favorite studies. You're probably well aware of it, uh, pro-inflammatory um, cytokines, as I mentioned, can access the brain in multiple mechanisms. Establishing causality is always difficult. And what I love about this study is the mechanisms through which a causality um, were facilitated by injecting individuals with an endotoxin from the E. coli group, and then putting individuals into an fMRI scanner, um, looking at the brain while individuals were processing faces, which is a highly salient stimuli for the brain. Um, and then looking at uh, activation in the amygdala. And as Tristan Inagaki and others have you know, demonstrate here, there appears to be no effect on the brain if you look at placebo, uh, whereas you get uh, a, a very large increase in neuronal signaling in the amygdala um, to threatening stimuli and particularly socially threatening stimuli, which may carry a lot of evolutionary weight when you're when you're sick. So this is, uh, I think, a good proof of concept that peripheral information can modulate brain function and brain structure. Again, this is highly adaptive in the short term, but we would argue that under conditions of chronic inflammation, this may start to generate problems. Another target uh, in the brain is the ventral striatum. And um, again, I, I think of the, the work of uh, John Sheridan's group and Andy Miller's group and others suggesting that um, this is again, not passive, but very adaptive so that when the brain and body are in a state of sickness, the last thing the brain wants to do is facilitate goal-directed behaviors. And it actually wants to disengage from goal-directed behaviors in order to conserve metabolic resources for healing, et cetera. Um, and there appears to be a down regulation of dopamine signaling in the ventral striatum, which, which slows down reward-related brain function um, and initiates a constellation of sickness behaviors, which is again, very conducive to um, healing and conserving metabolic resources and um, basically reserving and slowing down goal-directed behaviors in order to heal. And just again, as a nice proof of concept study, Naomi Eisenberger and, and colleagues have done a nice study in which, uh, again, participants were given an endotoxin exposed to uh, reward-related uh, stimuli. And as you can see uh, that if you're exposed to the reward um, if you're exposed to the endotoxin, you see decreased reward-related brain function. And Miller's group and uh, Kaplan and colleagues have shown that this appears to be associated with a reduction in uh, dopamine signaling in the ventral striatum via PET imaging, where they were able to radioactively label uh, dopaminergic turnover via FDG signaling. And um, this just shows you here, these are individuals before going through an interferon treatment, which is a powerful pro-inflammatory cytokine for treating hepatitis, and this is after, again, just proof of concept that the reduction in reward-related reward brain function may be in part driven by reductions in dopamine signaling. Again, highly adaptive in the short term, but may generate depression uh, when chronic. Depression has really been at the heart of much of my own personal work uh, and reward-related brain function and risk for depression. I just wanted to present one study that's based on a, a collaboration I'm, I've, I'm working on with Michelle Kras. This is our our brain mapped project. This is a, a large R01 we recently com completed where we recruited uh, 220 individuals, 18 and 19 year old participants who we selected based on threat and reward sensitivity. And they completed um, both threat and reward tasks in the scanner. I'll just focus on reward for, uh, briefly for this particular slide. Um, one of the themes of this particular uh, 
pro uh, this project is the need in, in research on depression to move away examining depression as a homogenous construct and to instead examine the relationship between brain circuits and very specific symptoms of depression. And we suggest that uh, reward-related brain function in the ventral striatum is likely specifically linked to anhedonia, the reduction in motivational pursuit as opposed to general distress and fear. Um, we tested this looking at both uh, ventral striatal activity and activity in the orbital frontal cortex, which is part of this frontal striatal circuit that facilitates goal-directed behavior and reward responsivity. Um, and what we found is, is that in line with prediction, decreased reward-related brain function in both the ventral striatum and the OFC uh, to reward cues was, was reduced in those with high levels of anhedonia. But the particularly important contribution of this analysis is that this was observed above and beyond other symptoms of depression. And so this was observed above and beyond general distress and fear, suggesting that the relationship between reward-related brain function and anhedonia appears to be unique. And it's also important that it's those anhedonic demotivational symptoms that inflammation is really facilitating. A third target in the brain of inflammation appears to be the prefrontal cortex, where there's evidence that inflammatory signaling may in part dampen prefrontal uh, mechanisms. We know that microglial signaling is very critical for synaptic pruning and dendritic pruning in the prefrontal cortex. So um, the prefrontal cortex appears to be a particularly, uh, an, a third important target um, for immune to brain signaling. And so I wanna present a study that kind of is, is a new study that we recently completed that, that examines this particular pathway. So um, in looking at the relationship between inflammation and the brain here, we focused on the central executive network. Um, and we in particular use uh, resting state functional connectivity. So the central uh, executive network, uh, I'm so, start off by saying the resting state functional connectivity is a method of fMRI brain imaging that examines the brain at rest. So it's really moving away from looking at specific brain regions to instead looking at large networks and kind of network connectivity. And one of the nice things about resting state is it allows you to examine the brain at rest. It allows you to examine it unconstrained by a task. It really moves away from individual regions and looks at larger networks. And the central executive network appears to be a particularly important network for regulating behavior, facilitating goal-directed mechanisms, et cetera. It's anchored in the prefrontal cortex and um, is uh, also anchored in portions of the posterior parietal cortex. It supports the regulation of emotion, behavior, and thought. And in particular, it seems to be important for the reappraisal of threats, this kind of top-down regulatory control of threat-related stimuli. And what we wanted to do in this study is look at the relationship between um, ex activity in the central executive network and peripheral inflammation. We looked at uh, circulating biomarkers, inflammatory biomarkers, CRP, and the uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, IL-6, IL-10, and TNF-alpha. But then we also wanted to go one step further and, and look at um, some other cells. So in addition, um, well, although cytokines are really a critical immune to brain channel, recent animal work is really highlighting the role of monocytes. And in, mo in rodents, chronic stress appears to mobilize a population of immature monocytes, in particular classical monocytes from the bone marrow. And in, this is uh, drawing a lot on the work from John Sheridan's group. And class mon classical monocytes appear to be actively recruited to brain regions rather than just kind of passively flowing from the immune system to the brain. So you have signaling from the endothelial cells in particular parts of the brain that are recruiting those inflammatory signals to the brain where they appear to be modulating um, anxiety and anxiety-like behaviors in rodents um, and this is the study that I'll be presenting now is the first study to examine the relationship between brain function and peripheral inflammation in classical monocytes. So for this particular study, we had 82 youth from urban Chicago. They completed a 10 minute resting state scan um, and a blood draw to assess inflammation. Um, we assessed inflammatory bio biomarkers, but also um, enumerated the major leukocytes uh, and what you see here is, is that on the x-axis, we have central executive network. Higher numbers here reflect stronger network connectivity. Higher values here reflect higher inflammation. And what you can see is, is that individuals with low network connectivity in the central executive network appear to have heightened inflammation. So this is, again, an inflammation composite. 
of the, the inflammatory biomarkers. And we see the same relationship for classical monocytes. Again, this is the first study to show a relationship between human brain function and peripheral signaling as measured by classical monocytes. Again, lower CNN, CEN uh, connectivity is associated with higher classical monocytes. Um, non other monocytes, I'm, I'm sorry, other uh, leukocytes, non-classical monocytes, lymphocytes, total white blood cells, et cetera, were not related um, to the CEN. And these results were also specific to the CEN. So we didn't see it in other uh, networks, the DMN or the salience network, et cetera. So it appeared to be particularly linked to these prefrontal regulatory systems. So we're suggesting that inflammation may weaken regulatory influence that the prefrontal cortex has over limbic reactivity in both the amygdala and in the um, ventral striatum, and in a sense, weaken that top-down regulatory control that the brain may have over the, bot or, or over the subcortex. What's intriguing here is, is that this is suggesting that inflammation is creating a neural profile that's very similar to what you see in depression. So inflammation is elevating uh, activity in the brain's threat system. It's lowering activity in the brain's reward system. And it's lowering the prefrontal regulatory system that's involved in managing those limbic brain regions or their subcortical brain regions and navigating optimal emotion regulation. And it just to pr provide a proof of concept of this, this is a meta-analysis on depression in the brain. And you can see that the amygdala, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is again anchored uh, the, an anchor for the central executive network and the ventral striatum are all implicated in depression, all of which appear to be targets for inflammation. All of what this is suggesting that inflammation when chronic in the body may generate dysphoria in the brain. And that state of dysphoria may drive behaviors to regulate that dysphoria. So the final kind of pillar in our neuroimmune network model is getting outside of biology and into the behaviors that people engage in. So if the brain is in a state of dysphoria because of high threat, low reward and low prefrontal executive control, you may see people start to regulate those behaviors. Now, if you wanna think of a optimal regulatory style, you'd go to a meditation retreat with Michael Irwin in Montana, and, you know, do uh, healthy related behaviors. But a lot of people don't do that. They go out and they eat donuts and they drink alcohol or they do drugs or they do other types of things that facilitate uh, reduction of dysphoria for the short term, but also increase inflammation. And so we know that these pro-inflammatory behaviors can increase inflammation. I wanna provide you with just one proof of concept study on how a reduced profile of reward-related brain function in the brain may actually facilitate pro-inflammatory behaviors. So this is a study that uh, is in revision um, with my colleague, Lauren Alloy, in which we really wanted to test the possibility that reduced reward-related brain function is not simply a consequence of using substances, but may be a pre-existent risk factor. So there's a lot of evidence to suggest that if people are using substances, alcohol, drug, other types of substances, you will get a corresponding reduction in reward-related brain function over time. Because what happens is the brain basically becomes coupled to that particular stimulus and can only kind of get the hedonic value from that particular stimulus. And so you get this kind of reduction in reward related brain function. But there's also evidence that low reward related brain function may be a pre existing vulnerability to engage in risky pro inflammatory behaviors. And the idea here is, is that if somebody's lacking kind of hedonic value in their brain, endogenously, they're lacking positive affect, they may seek exogenously or outside of themselves that which they're missing on the interior. And part of the way they may be doing that is to engage in pro-inflammatory unhealthy behaviors. So what we did in this study, this is a, a, a sample from Philadelphia. We had 110 participants completed the an fMRI reward task. This is the monetary incentive delay task developed by Brian Knudsen. Um, we followed these participants for two years. We assessed, assessed substance use during the two year follow-up period. Um, regions of interest were done on in the ventral striatum, which we know is this area of the brain that's very much involved in reward-related brain function. And what you can see here is, is that individuals with low reward-related brain function were more likely to go on and have higher levels of alcohol use um, and, and over the following two-year period. This is controlling four baseline levels of alcohol use. So this suggests that reward-related brain function at baseline is actually prospectively predicting the onset of reward-related, uh, I'm sorry, of, of alcohol and drug involvement relative to those with 
high ventral striatal activity. We see this also if you operationalize substance use as problematic substance use. So individuals with low reward related brain function are more likely to go on and have problematic substance use relative to individuals with high reward related brain function. Again, suggesting that when the brain is low on positive emotion, low on positive affect, it seeks strategies to increase that positive affect and substances are an important component of that. And so just to tie our neuroimmune network model together, what we're suggesting is, is that over time, the, um, the uh, kind of four pillars of the uh, neuroimmune network model can start to get stuck in this positive feedback loop with each other where you know, the brain's threat and reward and prefrontal systems are facilitating increased inflammation in the periphery. The increased inflammation in the periphery is accentuating this neural profile in the brain that's associated with depression. This creates a state of dysphoria, which in turn facilitates uh, the engagement in, in these behaviors and pro-inflammatory behaviors to help regulate that dysphoria. And then down the road that can create a series of mental and physical health problems. And so what I now wanna do is say, well, okay, that's great. You know, here's a pathway to illness amongst individuals who are in a neuroimmune dysregulation uh, profile. But I'd like to spend the rest of my talk saying, well, what might be the mechanisms that could help protect people from getting into this neuroimmune dysregulated state and being at risk for stress-related health problems? So one of this, the, the things that really interests me about this, this slide is it replicates the fairly well-established finding that growing up in poverty is associated with increased inflammation. Here you have socioeconomic status trajectory. These are low uh, socioeconomic status. This is high socioeconomic status. And you can see here that individuals with low socioeconomic status who grew up in that particular condition have um, high inflammation. But what's also intriguing to me about this figure is the extraordinary amount of variability amongst individuals who are living in low socioeconomic status. You see that it's not a simple story. You have more variability than you do have simplicity in terms of a main effect. And so the question that I want to examine next is what may, what may be some of the mechanisms that are driving this variability? And so, you know, when, when all else fails, draw on Bruce McEwen's work. Um, Bruce McEwen has a wonderful paper in New England Journal of Medicine, really looking at mechanisms of resiliency to what he was referring to as what he referred to as allostatic load, which is obviously a risk factor for a host of problems. And the first point of resiliency in Bruce's work that I wanna focus on is um, perceived stress. So we talked about the fact that the amygdala is modulated by stress and it's affected by stress. And so an interesting question could be, to what extent do amygdala activity protect you from stress um, if you're able to have reduced amygdala activity? So in this study, we looked at amygdala activity as a moderator of the relationship between early adversity and inflammation. Um, this is uh, a, a project uh, from Greg Miller's group and Edith Chen's group um, in which 207 youth uh, from urban Chicago came into um, the, the laboratory um, importantly, in this study, there's substantial variability with respect to exposure to poverty. 57% of individuals resided in poverty. Um, they completed a face paradigm in this particular study to assess threat-related neural activity. And then we did region of interest analyses on the amygdala. And we classified individuals in this particular study, not based on their poverty, but based on their profile of threat-related activity in the amygdala in response to threatening faces. So high reactivity would be individuals who have high amygdala reactivity to the faces and low reactivity would be individuals who have lower amygdala reactivity to the faces. And the idea here is this high reactivity in the amygdala which should be a risk factor and low reactivity should be a resilience profile. And that's what we see. So if you map individuals based on income to poverty ratio, here are individuals living in high socioeconomic status homes. Um, and these are again, children, 13 to 14 year old you can see that there's really no effect of the amygdala on their inflammatory profile. By contrast, if you go to individuals who are living in poverty, you can see that individuals with low reactivity have essentially no elevated infl inflammation. 
Uh, poverty doesn't influence the inflammatory signaling. By contrast, if you're living in poverty combined with high amygdala reactivity to threat, that's where you see increased inflammation. So one mechanism of resiliency may be reduced amygdala responsivity to threat while living in the midst of poverty or living in the midst of adversity, living in the midst of maltreatment. The question is, is well, what's driving low amygdala reactivity? Well, importantly, one of the primary drivers of subcortical threat processing and subcortical reward processing is the prefrontal cortex. So the prefrontal cortex plays an important role in top-down regulating these subcortical brain systems. There's known structural mechanisms by which the orbital frontal cortex and the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex can modulate both the striatum and the amygdala. And there's well-established work uh, that there's strong functional coupling between these different aspects of, of the brain. And so what we next wanna do is then say, well, might the central executive network be another source of resiliency in the brain? Might the CEN protect youth against heightened inflammation associated in this situation with neighborhood violence? So uh, same group of people. So this is the same study that I just presented on the prior slide, about 212 youth were exposed, um, uh, completed the study. This is based on, on research suggesting that youth who are exposed to neighborhood violence have heightened inflammation and risk for in, inflammatory mediated illness. We know that proximal exposure to violence is very bad for the immune system in the brain, but what's intriguing is, is that just living in a neighborhood with high levels of violence also appears to leave an important footprint on the brain and body. And so this is really looking at a, uh, vicarious exposure to violence just by living in a particular neighborhood associated with high murder rate. So our prediction is, is that elevated network connectivity or heightened connectivity in the CEN would actually protect children from the inflammatory consequences of living in a violent neighborhood. Violence here was operationalized as the murder rate of that neighborhood. Um, this analysis, we had 218 urban youth, same sample as I described above. Uh, they completed a resting state scan and a blood draw. And we focus here on um, an ex vivo paradigm in which pro-inflammatory cytokines were measured ex vivo after, these in, after the innate immune cells were exposed to both stimulators and inhibitors. And so the stimulators that were used were uh, lipopolysaccharide, uh, which is an uh, important endotoxin, um, a uh, mechanism that facilitates antiviral signaling, um, heat shock protein, which is involved in tissue repair, and AGE, which is known to be involved in various forms of toxins. The inhibitors that we looked at were glucocorticoids um, as operationalizes hydrocortisone and IL-10, which is a cytokine, but appears to have anti-inflammatory effects. All of the analyses I'll present here for this study were done in a composite. Uh, so the, a composite stimulator, a composite inhibitor, and a composite cytokine score in order to reduce multiple comparisons. So for this particular study, what we, uh, what we did, and this is again, wonderful work by Greg Miller's lab, is this is a heat map of Chicago. And these are actually a heat map from the police and FBI records in Chicago of the numbers of murders that happened in Chicago for the five years prior to the fMRI scan. Cool colors here reflect relatively low murder rates. These are murder rates that are essentially um, equivalent to the normal population in the United States. Hot colors here reflect higher murder rates. And as you can see in Chicago, there's substantial variability where some of the uh, red colors here are actually some of the highest murder rates that you would find in the United States. Each subject, is, each black dot is an individual subject in our study. So we were actually able to link these subjects to the particular location in the city. This is based on block group data, which basically looks at neighborhoods of about 300 to 1600 individuals. So this gives us fairly high resolution data um, at the level of uh, blocks and murder rates for Chicago. This is a, a graph that presents, uh, again, the ex vivo analyses. So this is a cytokine release, um, a composite score of cytokine release to the stimulators. This is more cytokine release here. This is less cytokine release. Neighborhood frequency of murder is here. So these would be individuals living in a high murder environment. These are individuals living in a low murder environment. And what you can see is, is that if you're living in a low murder environment, a low violence neighborhood, you, there's really no effect of this on your inflammation. You're basically protected. However, if you have 
low network connectivity in the central executive network, and you're living in a uh, neighborhood characterized by a lot of violence, you have heightened inflammation. By contrast, if you have high central ne executive network connectivity in this prefrontal kind of anchored system, you're essentially protected from neighborhood violence um, and the effect of that on your inflammation, suggesting that it's really the only in individuals with low network connectivity plus poverty who show the increased inflammation. If you had high uh, network connectivity, you were largely protected from the effect of inflammation, I'm sorry, protected from the effect of violence and inflammation. Um, this adjusted for a number of uh, covariates. I'm happy to talk more about these in the question and answer. We find a similar effect in the in inhibition composite. So higher values here reflect more sensitivity to inhibition. So the glucocorticoids and IL-6s are better at actually attenuating the inflammatory response and shutting it down. Here's less sensitivity to inhibition. And you're finding that these individuals have a, a, a poorer capacity to downregulate inflammation. We find the same finding here. So that with high exposure to uh, violence in a neighborhood, it's the individuals with low network connectivity who are really struggling to uh, inhibit the inflammatory response. Um, whereas if you have um, high network connectivity, you are essentially doing fine in terms of your capacity to inhibit the inflammatory response, suggesting that high network connectivity may actually be a resiliency profile while living in stress. Whereas the combination of low network connectivity in the central executive network plus high exposure to violence may put you at particular risk for problematic inflammatory signaling. Um, so that's inflammation. Let's try to translate this into health. Uh, we know, for example, that chronic inflammation is associated with a lot of problems, one of which is cardiovascular disease. So uh, Tawakal and colleagues have a nice model of which many people at the Cousins uh, Center do as well, in which stress can affect risk for heart attack via the immune system. So the idea is, is again that high amygdala activity would generate high sympathetic outflow, sympathetic nervous systems uh, pathways would synapse onto developing white blood cells, modulate the hematopoietic uh, signaling of these cells to create a pro-inflammatory phenotype. This inflammation would be in the body, facilitate atherosclerosis and lead to uh, problems with uh, cardiometabolic conditions. So this is a study from this, or this is a, a figure from this particular study. Here's an individual over a, a five year period who did not go on to have a particular uh, cardiovascular event. And this is an individual who went on to have, have an ischemic stroke. And what they did in this study is they used PET imaging to look at metabolic activity in the amygdala, the bone marrow, and in the uh, aortic signaling. And what they find is, is that the individual who went on to have a cardiovascular event had higher amygdala activity um, uh, as measured by PET imaging. They had higher bone marrow activity, suggesting increased inflammatory uh, signaling and likely the increase of innate inflammatory uh, mechanisms. And they also had increased signaling in arterial, inf of, of arterial inflammation near, near the aorta, suggesting again, a brain to immune to physical health outcome. And this is just two individuals. So then they looked looked at all of the individuals in the study. And what they found is, is that the relationship between amygdala activity and cardiovascular disease was mediated through inflammatory signaling in the bone marrow um, where amygdala activity, increased bone marrow activity, bone marrow activity, increased inflammatory uh, in signaling in the arteries and which in turn generated risk for cardiovascular disease. So in this next study then on resiliency, one I wanna mention, is can the CEN, this again, this prefrontal regulatory system, not only protect and modulate inflammation, but might it actually protect individuals for risk from cardiometabolic health outcomes that we know are mediated by inflammatory signaling. I'm not gonna go through the methods here because this is the exact same methods that I described before. This is the metric of violence um, and murder rate in the city of Chicago. In this particular scenario, the outcome is not inflammation, but it's actually cardiometabolic risk profiles. Uh, participants did a resting state scan. We divided participants based on their resting state functional connectivity into lower and higher resting state functional connectivity. And just like the inflammatory signaling, what you can see is, is that if you live in a low neighborhood environment, the brain's network connectivity doesn't really matter. But if you're in a situation in which you're in a high murder or high violence environment, 
and you have low resting state functional connectivity, you are at risk for a series of cardiometabolic health problems across multiple different indices. So this is insulin resistance, metabolic signs, metabolic syndrome composite, uh, body mass index, et cetera. The idea is, is that it's the individuals with low network connectivity in the prefrontal cortex combined with violence exposure where you see the problem. By contrast, a resiliency profile in the brain is individuals who have heightened central executive network activity. So I just wanna finish with uh, a last question, which is, well, okay, that's great. Now we all wanna have high central executive network connectivity. How do you generate high central executive network connectivity? And for this, I wanna hone in just on one particular um, environmental component that actually has to pertain to the environment with which the child is parented. So there's growing evidence that supportive parenting is a primary protective factor for growing up in early adversity. So parenting involving high sensitivity, high emotional support, low conflict, really appears to help children from the consequences of poverty. This is a study done by uh, a Greg Miller. I think this was probably done um, maybe by with, in collaboration with Steve Cole as well, maybe not. I, um, but uh, what you can see here is, is that uh, if you're living in, uh, with, in, in a high socioeconomic status environment, um, parental uh, nurturance doesn't have that much of an effect. But when you go down to poverty as operationalized by low education, less than a high school uh, education, and on the y-axis here, we have metabolic syndrome. What you can see is, is that if a person is living in poverty with a highly nurturant mother, they're largely protected from the metabolic consequences of poverty. It's really only the individuals who are growing up in poverty coupled with low maternal nurturance where you see the problem and suggesting that maternal nurturance may be a mechanism that really can help protect the psychobiology of the child. And this is also observed at the level of gene expression. I think this is the study that was done with Steve Cole. So, what we wanted to do in this last study I'm, I'll mention is say, well, does maternal nurturance also relate to the central executive network, which is this neural profile of resiliency that we suggest may be helpful for protecting people, children, adults from the consequences of poverty. This is a collaboration that we have with Gene Brody at the University of Georgia. Again, we looked at central executive network connectivity. And on the x-axis here, what we have is the number of years spent in poverty. On the y-axis, we have the central executive network. And again, what you can see here is that if you are living in a high socioeconomic status environment, poverty, uh, and you, you're in low poverty, the central executive network does not appear to have a robust relationship with your, uh, or, or this does not relate to central executive network. But if you are in a um, low support a supportive parenting environment, that's where you really start to see the reduction in central executive network connectivity. So it's the coupling of poverty plus low supportive parenting that appears to be associated with low central executive network. By contrast, if you're in a high supportive parenting environment and you're living in poverty, you see essentially no imprint of poverty on the central executive network, suggesting that a road to high central executive network connectivity and resiliency to poverty and adversity and stress may be through maternal nurturance. And we just were fortunate to receive a uh, center grant um, on this particular topic. Um, and uh, Greg and I both wanna say that please come and work with us because we're in the process of, uh, of recruiting uh, post-baccalaureate uh, research assistants and, and postdocs. So my Final slide, this is my closing slide, and then I'd love to have some, some conversation. Um, I've just uh, operationalizing adversity here as poverty, but it could be poverty, it could be maltreatment, it could be many different forms of stress. Um, this adversity is generating dysregulation in neuroimmune signaling. The, the neuroimmune signaling is generating a host of mental and physical health problems. Um, we also suggest that both threat and environmental um, mechanisms may provide resiliency to adversity with low amygdala activity, uh, high central executive network connectivity as being profiles of resiliency in the brain, and high kind of maternal nurturance and familial nurturance as being a possible mechanism for that. And so just some future directions, we obviously wanna look at adversity different 
adverse subtypes and do maltreatment have different or similar effects as poverty, et cetera. Um, causality is a major issue in this research. So we're interested in looking at longitudinal trajectories that really allow us to unpack causality. Um, we're starting to look more at psychiatric outcomes where we have a new grant looking at uh, reward related brain signaling and risk for depression. Um, uh, intervention and prevention strategies are important to us. So for example, you have programs that help people navigate um, living in poverty that Jean Brody has done um, that is a particular focus. You have mindfulness, you have neuroimmune methods that could be implemented and obviously policy changes. So with that, I just wanna thank uh, my colleagues and um, hopefully we have a little time for conversation. In particular, thank you to Michelle Kraske at UCLA, and Greg Miller and Edith Chen at Northwestern. So thank you. Thank you very much, Robin. This is a really a tour de force of a great um, overview of your work in the last uh, five to 10 years. Um, very interesting, lots of questions. Um, I wanna start with uh, some questions. I'm sort of picking up a, a number of themes from several people, including myself. And that is a little bit more interest in, or more attention to race and ethnicity breakdown. I know that you co-varied for that, but I think one of the questions that's coming forward has to do with um, how that's impacting the results. And, and particularly like this particular question and it had to deal with, did the patterns associated with resiliency with a high low network connect connectivity persist when not adjusting for the racial ethnic, ethnic identity? So a statistical concern is that if race ethnicity groups have different average network connectivity your results could be construed to mean that a person is relatively more or less resilient, given that they belong to a particular ethnic group. Yeah, so, it's a great okay, question. So, and we, mm -hmm. we interrogated this left, right, and center for, for all of the papers that I presented on this, because um, obviously this is, uh, was raised by reviewers, and obviously this is a hugely important point. Um, intriguingly, in both the, um, the central executive network papers, race and ethnicity had no effect on the findings. So we observed the relationship adjusting for race and ethnicity, but also the effect was there if we did not co-vary for race and ethnicity, if we looked at race and ethnicity as its own individual moderator. So this, you know, and this was particularly in one of the publications, we had to go to great lengths to kind of establish that. Um, and we really did interrogate it every which way and it was not driven by or moderated or influenced by race and ethnicity. And to what extent is that also true looking at interactions between SES and ethnicity? Did you also examine potential interactions? Well, part of it's a power issue, right? Okay. So, I mean, mm -hmm. we're starting to get into a, 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 a multi-level power, you know, multi-level interaction. Um, we did test interactions that were not present. I mean, we can't truly rule that out because you're starting to get into three-way interactions, but um, from every which way we looked at it, we did not see that race was a driving factor. One of the things that I also was struck with was the distribution of data on the, on the low group with the, some group. And I was curious particular about whether perceived discrimination and social issues of perceived discrimination may alter this, this, this particular network, the CEM network. Yeah. So I think it's a great point. And um, so the center grant that we have with Gene Brody is really uh, going to be examining this in, in detail. The, the grant is, is exclusively um, focusing on Black individuals living in the rural South to really examine the uh, influence of perceived discrimination, to examine the access to resources, to examine the sense of isolation um, of, of racial discrimination on these systems. So mm -hmm. we're really going to be trying to interrogate that in more detail. Yeah, that's um, you know, we know, for example, in terms of health disparities, that black individuals struggle at every metric of health outcomes. They, you know, in terms of cardiometabolic conditions, atherosclerosis, obesity, various things like that. And our suggestion is, is that living under conditions of chronic poverty, chronic adversity, chronic exposure to racial discrimination, you know, leaves a very deleterious footprint on, on, on individuals under those circumstances. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I think we're really, you know, focused on now on seeing one, can you, are those relationships present? Two, can you use interventions that help people navigate stress to be less impacted by poverty and discrimination? And three, just the kind of social activists in me would say, 
can we use hopefully the science data to inform policies that would create more equity in society so we don't need to focus on, you know, or do, you know, so resources don't need to be focusing on discrimination and poverty because uh, obviously those are societal issues that can be hopefully resolved with policies. Mm -hmm. um, let me come to another sort of set of questions and that has to do with this parental warmth issues. And there's a questions about, about parental warmth and whether that's true from both mother and father where you looked at the mm -hmm. source of that parental warmth because I know that there are findings certainly showing differences in biological outcomes based upon whether whether the warmth comes from the father or from the mother. Yeah, so, uh, you know, most, most of this work, and I, you know, I will need to channel Gene Brody as much as I can, because this is really his work, um, suggest two things. One is most of the work has been done in maternal nurturance, um, and there's been less investigations of fathers. Um, but the preliminary evidence that I've heard Gene express suggests that maternal nurturance appears to carry more weight than paternal nurturance. Now, what are the mechanisms of that? I'm not entirely sure. Um, but the, the, again, the preliminary research I've seen Gene and others present on this suggests that maternal nurturance appears to be particularly important for initiating these protective factors uh, as it pertains to exposure to early adversity. Okay. Uh, a question that that I, you know, entertaining myself, I'll just jump in with one question that I had, I have several, but one is has to do with the CN findings and how they map onto the reward pathways, because, because you certainly show that reward is very important in substance abuse. And so, so, so and obviously substance abuse may alter this, the connectivity of the CN. So how have, have you looked at those together and how they might conspire to produce these changes in inflammation and also outcomes that you're that you're interrogating? Yeah, so we're very interested in, in my group in what, what's called frontal stridal signaling, right? So this is basically the connectivity between the basal ganglia and the prefrontal cortex. So we're using diffusion imaging to look at these boutique tracks between the ventral striatum and the prefrontal cortex, as well as functional connectivity. Um, and there's interesting profiles that emerge. Uh, the growing evidence, or preliminary evidence suggests that people who are prone to depression engage the prefrontal cortex in a way that shuts down the ventral striatum. So some research actually suggests that people with depression have increased activity in the prefrontal cortex, but they're engaging the prefrontal cortex in a way that's attenuating the subcortical reward systems. Whereas people who are in at risk for depression are engaging that prefrontal cortex in a way that accentuates reward signaling. And so I would really see a neuroimmune model of reduced reward related brain function as being like three pits to the ventral striatum. One would be a prefrontal regulatory system that is hyper you know, active and down-regulating the ventral striatum. So it's basically attenuating positive emotion. It's, it's reducing a person's capacity to savor. The second would be that the, inflama the inflammatory signaling that that dysphoric state may generate will also further reduce reward-related brain function. And third is you have then the person going out in the environment engaging in pro-inflammatory behaviors, which is this kind of third fan that comes in and feeds the fire. Because now we also know inflammation, for example, accentuates reward-related brain function. So I'd see a convergence of like top-down regulatory control, poor behaviors that are pro-inflammatory, um, and then you know, coupled with just the, the basis of depression in the brain. Okay. Um, we have time for one last question. It, it has to do with the substance abuse work. And, um, and since substance, and that's how I framed the other question, but substance abuse is obviously related to damp and reward, um, reward activity. Uh, inflammation is important in that. And I wanted to link to that uh, the work of Mark Shuckett, who's been doing work on family history positive and family history negative has also shown that family history positives, those people at high risk for alcohol use disorder have a blunted response to alcohol and potentially blunted reward re responses. So has anyone, or have you thought about looking at the gen genetic components of some of this alterations, uh, getting at these questions of how these pathways are, uh, how, are in, in, instantiated or very early on in one's life? Yeah, it's a great question. So we, I, you know, I've never done a DNA sequencing study um, in my career. Uh, we're doing a lot of stuff with gene expression pathways at the moment with mRNA. 
Um, but I'll just speak it more conceptually rather than genetically. So whether it's genetics or some other form of vulnerability, um, you know, I think a, a growing hypothesis, and I, I pulling this in part based on Nora Volkov's work, who's done some of the great work on reward signaling and addiction, suggests that that profile of reward-related brain function may be a pre-existent risk factor for engaging in the addictive substances. So, you know, if you have some genetics profile that is associated with reduced reward-related brain function you may have a real risk factor for addiction. Again, the idea is, is you're seeking outside of yourself that which you're lacking on the interior. And that may increase your profile to engage in you know, substance-related behaviors. What's intriguing, we also have evidence to suggest that people with really high profiles of reward-related brain function are also at risk for addiction. And this is some of our bipolar work, which suggests there may be a non-linear relationship between reward-related brain function and addiction. The pathways may be different. A person with really high reward related brain function may be more prone to engage in sensation seeking, which puts them in contact with substance. A person mm -hmm. with really low reward related brain function mm -hmm. may be at risk for regulating their dysphoria, but eventually both roads may lead to Rome and put them in contact with the substance to the point where their brain gets hijacked by the addiction. Well, thanks. Thank you very much again, uh, Robin, for uh, this just a really, to be here. Yeah, really you. insightful uh, and very rewarding talk today. <laughs> uh, so we wish you very the best and appreciate again your participating. And thank you. I know I wasn't able, I apologize to many of our attendees. I wasn't able to go through all the questions. I hope I hit most of the uh, major, major ones and try to integrate them in a way that everyone's questions were being heard. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Hopefully we'll see you all in person again at some point. <laughs>